welcome to Scoop and Scale, where we dish up the science and weigh facts about mostly equine nutrition. I'm Michelle Anderson. I spent two decades working in equine media, and I currently create content and help veterinarians and businesses connect with horse owners through my consulting business, Cadence Marketing and Media. I'm a trail rider, dressage rider, and an at-home horse keeper. And I'm equine nutrition consultant, Dr. Claire Tunis of Clarity Equine Nutrition. I develop diet plans for horses ranging from metabolic seniors to Olympic athletes. I also consult for equine nutrition companies. I'm a scientist, dressage rider, and a pony club mom. Claire and I collaborated for years when I was the editor of an equine publication, and she was one of our regular contributors. We'd finish work, but we always had more to talk about. New products, new research, and our own horses. This podcast is an extension of those conversations. It's for anyone who wants to make better choices when it comes to feeding and caring for their own horses. And before we get started, a quick disclaimer. The information in this podcast is general and not meant to replace the individualized advice of your own qualified equine nutritionist or veterinarian. While I have a PhD in nutrition, I'm not a veterinarian and can't give medical advice. With that, thank you for joining us and we hope you enjoy the following episode. We talk all the time about how forage is the foundation of equine diets. And if you've listened to our other episodes, you've heard Claire talk about using information from a hay analysis as part of making sure your horses get the nutrition they need. We also receive a lot of questions online and um, via email from people wanting to know more about hay testing. Yes, that is definitely true. I definitely get a lot of questions about what is hay testing and then how do we test? Where do you send the samples? It always kills me when somebody's super excited and they've gone and got a test and they've gone and got the wrong thing tested. That's always disappointing. And I also get asked a lot of times too, is it even worth testing? Yeah. And as a horse owner who's looked at these results quite a bit, sometimes I still wonder what what am I looking at? So once you have the results, you have to know what to do with them. And today to help us understand all that better, we are joined by Cassie Streeter, who's a horse person. She earned a master's degree in animal science from Cornell studying equine metabolic syndrome and PPID. She's been with Dairy One and Equa Analytical for 13 years, where she's currently the NIR services manager. Welcome, Cassie. Oh, thank you. So first, can you explain to us what NIR is and how that applies to Equa Analytical. And for our listeners, Equa Analytical and Dairy One, lots of times when you get your results from your hay grower, they're on a piece of paper that has the name Equa Analytical Dairy One on it, because that's a company that's done that analysis. So that's that's you guys. But what what is the N- NIR and what does that do for, for horse owners? So in my particular rule here at Dairy One, I work with our NIR technology. So NIR stands for Near Infrared, and we use reflectance spectroscopy here. It's a rapid, non-destructive way of analyzing feed and forage samples, but it's also used in pharmaceuticals and other industries. The way that we use it here at Area 1 is we're able to develop really robust NIR calibrations, and we're able to translate that into a service that we provide to our customers, whether they be on the Dairy 1 side with our dairies or for our equine market with Equianalytical. So- that testing and what Dairy One offers, my understanding is that creates a standard globally for the results that you're getting from analysis that are being provided. Do I understand that correctly? Yes. With NIR technology, you need really robust calibrations, and those can be very expensive to develop. So we're able to do that here at Dairy One since we are we provide a full suite of what chemistry services as well as NIR, and we can continually update our NIR calibrations for feeds and forages with different seasons, different crops, different products. There are always new products coming onto the equine market all the time, and we're able to continually develop our calibrations for those markets. And we license our calibrations to labs all around the world. We currently have 30 different members to our NIR affiliate network that I oversee, and they're in over 16 different countries at this point. We range from Japan, China, Australia, Germany, Italy, Canada, Mexico, and a few here in the U.S., in addition to our home base here in Ithaca. 
So that's really great because I know years ago, I remember people, you know, from overseas trying to figure out how they could send you samples, you know, in the mail from overseas to New York. And there are some tricks there with sending plant material into a foreign country. So having those services available to them potentially in their home country is really beneficial and, and probably quicker too in getting their results back. Very much so. Very much so. We're very active in the international market. We're getting samples internationally every single day here in the in our home base for both on the Dairy One side and Equi Analytical side. We've really pushed the Dairy One side of things, but we are looking to expand Equi Analytical. We actually have a partner in Australia that we are looking to spread our Equi Analytical services to. So stay tuned. And for our listeners who may not be familiar with trying to get plant materials across international borders, it's like when you're traveling internationally and you can't take fruit to Mexico and you can't bring it back or even flying within the U.S. uh, when you're going to Hawaii, you can't bring plants back and forth. Or for me in Oregon, trying to go to California, they don't want us to necessarily bring certain plants or plant products. So that that's what that's all about. I had a quick question I was going to um, ask you about the NIR because you talk about all this calibration and stuff. And so I just wanted to kind of clarify for our listeners. And you also mentioned wet chemistry and I have slight nightmares about wet chemistry. So <laughs> when I was doing my PhD, I did a lot of forage analysis and um, it was all wet chemistry. And I have, you know, memories of boiling buns and burners and little like silicone scrubby things and trying to get all the material to go back down inside the beaker as you're boiling it under heat and getting it back in all the reagents and stuff. But with NIR, you're not doing that. Like if I send a sample to you to analyze using NIR, you're going to grind that sample and then shine your light at it, right? And you're going to measure what reflects back at you and then compare that to this sort of library of standards that you have. Is that correct? I couldn't describe it any better myself. That was excellent. (laughs) You did an excellent job. So as you said, you shine a light onto the sample. There's a detector on the other side that's measuring the light that's being reflected back. And it gives that sample a spectral fingerprint. And then that spectral fingerprint is used to go into our large library of samples and it will find samples that are the most like it and then return results to you on protein levels, um, fiber levels, sugars, minerals, all of those different components. And it takes less than a minute to actually complete all of those analyses from loading it into the instrument to getting your results. So we have these two different ways of analyzing samples, it sounds like. If I send you a hay sample, I could either have you do wet chemistry on it or NIR do I get the same results? I mean, why would I use one over the other? Kind of what's the difference as far as from a horse owner's perspective as to why they might want to do one over the other? Sure. You have some pros and cons here between the two. So wet chemistry, which some people also call it the reference chemistry, it's the most precise analysis that you can get. Keeping in mind that even if you take the same sample and you measure it time and time and time again, you won't necessarily get the exact same answer every single time. There is a little bit of variation that's built in, analytical variation. So wet chemistry is the most precise, meaning you have the least amount of variability. NIR, that analysis, you will add a little bit more variability. So in terms of accuracy is the same, but precision is different. So why would you use wet chemistry? It depends what you're analyzing, NIR can handle most of the forages. And when we're talking in the equine world, right, we mean hay most of the time. Very rare that I hear people feeding haylage or silage, but it happens. But we're, we're mainly talking about hay when we're talking about forages. So NIR, since we have such robust calibrations, we can handle a lot of different types of hay. We've got timothy, we've got orchard, alfalfa, vetch, lucerne. We have a lot of different types built into our calibrations. If you have a forage that's outside of the norm or a bit of a more exotic species, that might be a reason to get wet chemistry. And also if you're doing any kind of complete feeds. So if you're feeding a complete pellet or something like that, or it could even be a forage pellet that has a little something extra in it. I've been seeing a lot of forages with flax in it. These are new products. I don't have them built into my hay calibrations yet. I'm hoping to. 
But there are some of these products that are coming onto the market that we might not have coverage of if it's something beyond just the forage. In that case, I would recommend wet chemistry. Wet chemistry also does take a bit of time. There are multiple steps. It's a little more expensive because of the reagents, the time it takes more. So it's also a little bit more expensive. The advantage to NIR is it's rapid. If I get your sample in in the morning, we can have it ground and analyzed and results out the door later that afternoon. Which, as a horse owner who has been trying to buy hay in competitive markets, having that kind of information that quickly is really helpful. Because we, in my area, the hay sellers, they want to sell the hay as quickly as possible. And I know, or I've heard from my dental hygienist, whose husband is a hay grower, that... um, (laughs) We horse owners are viewed as being a little fussy and then they don't necessarily want to sit and wait on the, us to get our results to decide if we want to buy their hay because there's someone else who might want to buy it before we, we get that back. So that's interesting that that can be done so quickly. Obviously, there's a lot of science happening. We're talking about chemistry and labs. and But here on the horse owner side, why should we consider having our hay tested? Well, as you noted earlier, hay makes up the majority of your horse's diet, there's a lot of information there that you don't have access to if you're not testing. And nowadays, I mean, I can tell you from my research and also just my experience with Equanalytical, I would say easily 90% of our questions are coming from people with horses that have special dietary needs, whether it's your broodmare, your growing horse, your metabolic horse, your horse that has PPID or Cushing's. Not knowing what is in your hay, it's great that you have a guarantee tag for your grain, but that's not making up the majority of your horse's diet. You really need that hay component to know what's in there, especially if you have any kind of special needs for your horse. And I mean, everyone's horse is special at the end of the day. We always want to make sure they're all special. And visual inspection only gets you so far. You can walk in, you can look at a bale, you can see if it's moldy or it's dusty, but you can't tell me exactly how much protein is in it or how much fiber or what the minerals look like. That's really important information to have. Yeah, and sometimes it's deceptive, isn't it? I've certainly tested some hay that I've looked at it and thought, oh, this is pretty stemmy. This will be not a great analysis. And it's come back and you're like, wow, that's like going to be way more digestible than I thought it was going to be. So it can be, I mean, there are some basic rules of thumb when you're looking at hay and based on maturity of the plants, but it's just like horses. It's not that simple sometimes. Sometimes you get some surprising results back. But yeah, no, I always... I always tell people it's worth testing their hay and for all those reasons you stated. And, you know, especially if they have many months worth of hay in their barn, right? It gets tricky when they just have, if they're buying hay at the feed store, right? Because you need to have a good sample size, right? Because the data you get back is only as sort of as good as the sample that you take. So I get people saying to me, well, can I just walk around my stack and grab a handful of hay and I have a hay cora or hay probe, and I know you sell those on the Equianalytical website. And I'm always recommending people to use that if they're going to start testing their hay and do it fairly frequently. But why should people make that investment of actually taking a proper sample? As you said, using a bale core or a hay probe really is the best way. When you're doing a grab sample, it's difficult because your hand will naturally grab the long stocky parts in your hay. So usually what we find is if you're doing a grab sample, you're probably underestimating the quality of your hay as where the hay probe is going straight into your bale. You're also not damaging your bale as much. You know, when you want to do a grab sample, you have to cut your bale open, reach in and grab a handful and then move on to the next bale. And normally in a barn, space is at a premium and it's hard to <laughs> hard to cut open 20 bales and grab a sample out of the center. But a coral will really get that representative sample. And to your point, what I like to tell people is that, you know, here at Equianalytical, we can accurately analyze the sample that you provide. Whether or not the sample you provide accurately reflects the hay you have, well, that's a different matter. So we certainly recommend, we certainly recommend having a hay probe. As you said, we do have the Penn State hay probe available on our website. People can go there. We have seen some vets have started to bring hay probes with them to provide the service. And we've also seen some farriers start to have that as an offer. Your local cooperative extension, they have hay probes available for you. That's another good resource. Or even riding clubs or driving clubs or something like that. They'll purchase as a club and then they share it amongst their members. So there's a few different ways to go about it. Instead of just having to make the investment on an individual basis, you might be able to share a probe amongst different people. 
but definitely with the hay cores, it's it's the gold standard for sand blight, whether it be small bales, large bales, round bales, if anyone feeds those, hay core is definitely recommended. Yeah, I think Jill borrows one from her local feed store. She helps us with this podcast. And yeah, it turns out her feed store has one. So, and for anyone who hasn't seen a core, it's a long probe that gets drilled into the bales, either by a hand crank or with a drill, you know, by a hand drill that attaches to do that. It takes a lot of cranking by hand. <laughs> so, oh, gosh, when I was doing my PhD and I had to sample my hays before I fed them, I had the hand crank version of the Penn State Pro, but that's all we had. And it was summer in Davis. So it was pushing 100 degrees, if not higher. And it was really hard work and really not fun. And so when I became an equine nutrition consultant and decided I needed a hay probe, and I found that they make the pet and state with a little doohickey on the end that you can stick it into an electric drill or a battery operated drill and then do it that way. I was like, oh, no more hand cranking for me. It was a rite of passage, but I'm never going back to a hand crank. I'll just tell you that right now. So, yes. Yeah. So I, I have a question. It's a split question between the two of you. So I'm going to start with Cassie and then for Claire. So I've heard protein mentioned and we've talked about grabbing not grabbing, but drilling samples from multiple bales to make sure you get a good quality cross-section of the hay that you're testing. But what nutrients can we test for, Cassie? And then, Claire, what nutrients as a nutritionist are you most interested in seeing on that analysis when you're helping formulate diets? Yeah, great question. On the equinolytical side, we offer a full suite of course nutrition testing services. We can get your core components, like you said, your protein, fiber, your non-structural carbohydrates, so your water-soluble carbohydrates, ethanol-soluble carbohydrates, and starch. Very important for that those with uh, metabolic horses or sugar-sensitive horses. We can also provide uh, mineral analysis, including the microminerals, such as zinc and copper. I know that those are very important for balancing. And we have, um, you know, we have a few other um, services out there. We can, we can also do fat testing. And as I said, if you're doing a complete feed, if you want to send in, maybe you've made your own custom blend and you're curious to know what's in it. You know, you've had a, a little bit of this and a little bit of that, and you'd like to know what you have. We can go ahead and do the full suite from start to finish with your macronutrients all the way down to the microminerals. Yeah. So when I... If I have a client that has a hay analysis and when I'm looking at a hay analysis, you know, right off the bat, probably the thing that I'm most drawn to are all the different carbohydrate fractions. And normally, because oftentimes the people that have had their hay tested, as Cassie says, are doing it because they have a horse that has metabolic challenges most of the time and they're trying to find a hay that's low in starch and sugars. And so my eye is sort of drawn to that. So I'm looking at the water-soluble carbohydrate, the ether-soluble carbohydrate, and the starch. And these are just different types of sugars, and they get digested in different places in the digestive tract. So we have a sense then of how that's going to affect the horse's glucose and subsequently insulin levels, which is really important for horses that have insulin dysregulation. So I'm looking at those. I'm also kind of interested by, Cassie mentioned the fiber. I'm kind of interested by what's called the acid detergent fiber because that's one of the measures we use to say how digestible is this hay actually going to be for this horse? And it gives me a sense of how available the nutrients in the hay are going to be because, you know, Michelle, you mentioned protein, but when we analyze protein in a lab, we actually analyze the nitrogen and then we do a little math and we come up with the protein. It's, there's a reason why it's called crude protein. It's a crude calculation. It's not actually, it's our best guesstimate based on the nitrogen in that hay. So it may or may not be accurate. And not all of that protein may be available. If it's all kind of bound up in these structural carbohydrates and is going to require microbial fermentation to release it and make it available to the horse, that's great. But that happens in the horse's hindgut. And that's after the site of protein absorption in the digestive tract. So not all that protein may actually be available for absorption in the small intestine if the hay is super mature. So the ADF gives me a sense of, you know, how mature was that hay and how digestible is it going to be for the horse? So I look at that too and sort of 30 to 33, 34%, I think of as being a pretty good quality hay and pretty digestible for horses. You know, as you get up into those high 30s, pushing 40, it's not as digestible anymore. Doesn't mean it's bad, <laughs> right? But I'm not going to feed 
my hay that has ADF that's pushing 40% to my weanling who doesn't have a very well-established hindgut, but it might be a super choice for my pudgy pony that struggles with weight maintenance. And maybe I just want to give him as much hay as possible, but I don't want it to be super available necessarily. So having that is really helpful in picking who that hay might be suitable for. And then obviously just all the normal things, how many calories per pound is in it and calcium phosphorus ratio. And then as Cassie mentioned, those trace minerals, copper, zinc, in certain places, I encourage my clients to do selenium testing, not always, but sometimes depending on where they are geographically and whether that might be a high or super low selenium location. That can be really helpful for me to know how I should then supplement that diet and add selenium or not. And I know, Michelle, you're in sort of an area that we have none. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. So then sometimes it's like, but I learned living in Northern California, like we had a pretty low selenium geography. And then every so often I'd get a hay bat that actually had remarkably higher selenium. So you'd get these pockets of places that had higher selenium. So it can be useful to test those. So those are the things I'm looking at. And one of the reasons I really like using labs that do equine testing is that you'll get back an equine DE, digestible energy. And as I said earlier in our introduction, it kills me when people come to me and they're super excited and they've gotten their hay test and I get it back and it's full of net energy of lactation and net energy of maintenance. And I'm like, well, that's not applicable to horses. We don't work on that energy system. And so it's that's so disappointing because they're so excited, but it's like they got the wrong tests done when they've used a lab that doesn't even do testing for horses. So, yeah. And something that's really popular, we actually do, you know, Claire, going back to your original point about focusing on WSC, ESC, and starch, we actually offer a wet chemistry package that offers just those three components. Oh, yeah. It's really popular with a lot of customers that they do have a horse that has the insulin dysregulation that you were talking about. They'll use that to kind of screen the hay to begin with. And if it meets the requirements on that part of the carbohydrate side, they'll then call in and we can actually add more analyses to that sample. So if they do want to get the protein and the fibers and add more analyses, we'll hang on to that ground sample for several weeks. So if you get your results back and you take a look and say, oh, I might want to buy this hay. Now I want to know about the protein and the fiber and the fat and the minerals. We can add those analyses to that sample and do a follow-up. That's pretty popular. We've seen that with a lot of our customers when they're trying to make those hay purchasing decisions is to start with the carb pack and then add from there once they find a hay that they like so they can continue with ration balancing and finding the appropriate supplement. So Claire mentioned lactation and a couple of other things that horse owners might not be interested in. And I don't know that it's obvious other than the fact that the company is called Dairy One. Uh, what other animal producers would be interested in hay analysis. And so lactation, uh, we're going to take the, it's a little bit of an obvious path that we're talking about the dairy industry and milk production and that broodmares need to produce milk, but not like, like dairy cows do. So Cassie, what is included in a horse specific analysis that might not be included in other hay testing? Or is it all pretty much the same? across the board. Usually with dairy, I will say we usually we usually have much more on a dairy report for the reasons okay. that you said. Yeah. We're trying to get a product out of that dairy cow, namely milk. So we do have a lot of energy calculations or uh, a rate of digestion for the fiber fractions, the neutral detergent fiber digestibility at different time points. We have a lot of those different values, but in the equine world, you know, your crude protein values, your acid detergent fiber, neutral detergent fiber, water-soluble carbs, ethanol-soluble carbs, starch, ash content, fat, and then some of your minerals, that's pretty consistent between the equine and the dairy side. We really did, kind of like you said, you get these reports that are, you know, NEL, NEM, NEG, NDFD that applies to a rumen, or it says I have a rumen. So we actually trimmed it back so it actually makes the reports a bit cheaper um, because otherwise our equine customers are paying for all these crazy numbers and they're thinking, okay, so I'm paying extra money for numbers I can't use. Yeah, and it's analysis, yeah, analysis paralysis when you get all these numbers and oh, yes. then and then you have to call Claire to help. <laughs> <laughs> well, I have lots of those. Looking at. I have get lots of those. Well, I have this analysis and I'm sure, 
but I have no idea what it means, right? So um, <laughs> yeah. yeah, I do I do quite a lot of those. And yeah. the one thing that I notice that people should perhaps be aware of that I don't see on a on an analysis for ruminants is like quite often they're missing the trace minerals, right? So, you know, they don't always have the zinc, copper, manganese. They have calcium, phosphorus, sodium, because those are really important for something called DCAD, which we won't get into, but it's a big deal in dairy cows, especially when they're going from being pregnant to having carved and producing milk. So that's a big deal for them. So you often see all the macro minerals on a dairy analysis. And I'm not specifically talking about the sort of dairy one equi-analytical labs, but for example, when I was in California, we had, because we had such a big dairy state, we had a lot of local forage labs that were super specialized to dairy and they just didn't do trace mineral analyses on their dairy analyses. And so those were often the labs that then people that lived in those dairy heavy areas would just use the lab down the street and then get back things that just didn't relate to horses. And then we're missing a bunch of information I really wish we had only told part of the picture. So that's why I love going to a lab that does offer equine specific packages. I want to circle back to the discussion on taking samples from hay and getting it tested. And those reports, especially in markets like I've been in recently, I think most people in the U.S. horse owners have had challenges with finding hay or hay prices going up in the last few years. And the hay moves really quickly. And I've been in situations where the seller will say, well, I don't have an analysis on this field from this year, but here is the analysis report from last year or four years ago. <laughs> does that, Cassie, does that report apply to that field and the hay produced in it every year. Is that field always going to produce the same hay? If you had the exact same conditions in soil, environment, rainfall, sun exposure, seeding, sure. <laughs> but fertilizing water. that never happens. <laughs> yeah. As we know, you know, seasons change year to year. Several years ago here in the Finger Lakes region, we actually had a drought that was particular to just our little area. If you traveled 40 miles away, completely different, sufficient rainfall, Crops were growing beautifully around here. It looked like a desert. So yeah, that report from last year isn't going gonna, isn't gonna to tell me enough about the hay in front of me. We do know hay producers that will test their hay. We do encourage still on the side prior to feeding to your horse to also test it yourself simply because you don't always know how the hay producer tested the hay or how many bales did they sample to represent a lot and then how are they dividing that lot before they sell it to you. So we recommend testing with that. But in terms of, yeah, the season to season, the growing conditions, you know, especially nowadays, you're never quite sure what you're going to get. If you have drought conditions happening, you could look at things like nitrates. If you have excessive rainfall, you could have crops that are, you know, just the composition can really, really vary. If it's a new seeding, if they've applied fertilizer, any of those factors can really influence the, you know, the nutrient content of that hay. Yeah. So with that in mind, can we test pasture grasses to know what's going to go into the hay or if it's not being hayed, can you test the pasture that, that horses are on? Absolutely. Absolutely. That is a very popular forage to be testing as, you know, pasture. I know during the summer when I had my horse out on pasture, I want to save money. You don't want to have to buy that hay so you turn them out on pasture. We can test pasture samples with those, you're sampling from about 12 to 20 sites. You want to make sure that you're sampling at grazing height, you know, so we're not picking it out by the roots. Hopefully your horse isn't eating the roots of the grass. You'll get your sample together from all those different sites, mix it, put it into a bag, squeeze out as much air as you possibly can, and then keep that sample cooled, if not frozen, and use an expedited shipping service to get it here to the lab for testing. The reason for that is that it is still live plant material for a while and you still have respiration happening and it could change the profile of that pasture sample. But pasture sampling is very important, especially if you turn your horses out on grass and that becomes the majority of their diet. Absolutely. And you will likely want to sample several times throughout the grazing season because that will change the same way your first and second cutting haze will change. You know, your fresh pasture that you've just turned the horses out on will be different from after it's been allowed to be grazed and grow up again, it's also going to have a different composition. Yeah, I'm sitting here thinking about your carb package and thinking too, you know, people, especially people who keep their horses at home and maybe have the ability to say, well, I'm going to turn my horse out in the morning from 6 a.m. till noon or get home from work at lunch. 
and, you know, turn my horses out then. And they want to know what the sugar content is of that grass. So the ability to kind of take, you know, a sample at eight in the morning and another one at noon and a different one at five and send three in and get the carb packet, you know, get the carbs looked at to say, okay, well, what really is happening in my field throughout the day? And when would be a good time to, I think people might find that really interesting, how that changes throughout the day, as, especially if you have sunny weather, how different it is from first thing in the morning to the middle end of the afternoon. Living in the desert, I don't have, like, usually I think it's a luxury of having to deal with pasture, but you're stressing me out, Claire. <laughs> so <laughs> <laughs> That's my science brain going, oh, interesting. <laughs> I'll be quiet. <laughs> so, <laughs> Claire, do you use pasture reports and helping formulate diets for, for horses? Does that come up very often? Not very often, if I'm totally honest. Yeah, no, not so often for me. Mostly because, again, as I said earlier, people who are coming to me with forage analyses generally are horses that aren't metabolic. And therefore, they've just made the management decision not to put their horses on pasture or they're muzzling them. So their intake is really significantly reduced to a point of being a very minor part of their diet. So we're not typically analyzing pasture. If your horse can be out free form on pasture and no worries, you know, then typically you're not super concerned about forage analyses and you may not be coming and seeking my assistance. So I don't see a lot of them now. So Cassie, here we see some horse owners in my area in in Central Oregon doing uh, custom farming. So they'll contract with a grower to grow a specific kind of hay. Usually it's low sugar type hay. Is that a place where the pasture testing would help the farmer make sure that they're producing the hay rather than just producing and going, what did we get at the end? Can they test along the way to make sure that they're creating what their buyer is hoping for? We often see this on the dairy side because they will often be harvesting crops that they're then going to ensile. So yes, if you want to monitor your quality as it's going throughout the season, that is helpful. You will have, you know, when your hay dries, you will have a little bit of respiration. So you will have a little change in composition after you cut, but to get an idea of which direction it's headed in and trying to also kind of find that appropriate maturity of when you should be cutting. We do see some producers that are doing testing throughout the season to keep track of the forage that they're producing. So we mentioned the metabolic horses quite a bit, and that is a big driver in hay analysis. If you're just at the most basic level, a horse owner who wants to do the right thing for your metabolic horse, and you keep hearing, I need a low NSC hay, Claire, how can this analysis help you make sure that you're getting a low NSC hay for your horse? And what does low NSC even really mean? (laughs) Oh man, that's that's a question for an entire episode. Yeah, and so NSC stands for non-structural carbohydrate. Not to be confused with NFC, which is not the same thing. And uh, maybe Kathy can speak to that a little bit. But NSC is, if you're a plant scientist, (laughs) it's your water-soluble carbohydrate plus your starch, right? And the gurus out there researching insulin dysregulation you know, in our universities of veterinarians that do this kind of work, their recommendation is to, and it's the recommendation of the equine endocrinology working group as well, is to try and keep the NSC content below 12%. And that's 12% on a dry matter basis, which creates a whole other conversation. So hold that term, we'll get to it in a second, dry matter basis. So you're going to, when you get your report back, there's going to be two columns, right? There's going to be dry matter basis and then something called as fed. And so you want to be looking at this, you want to be looking at the columns on the dry matter basis side and adding together your percentage of WSC and the percentage of starch and hoping that it's below 12% for those particular horses. So that's kind of how we use that. WSC also includes the ether soluble carbohydrate fraction, okay, which is another number on your test. So the WSC tends to be higher number because it includes the ESC. ESC in starch actually gets digested in the small intestine enzymatically and goes into your horse's bloodstream sort of as glucose and then causes insulin to go up. So that's the most sort of immediately concerning pair of numbers There are some people out there that kind of say, oh, you know, really you should have an ESC and starch of less than 10%. 
I still go with an NS, and I do look at that, and that's certainly something to be con- considering. I still go with NSC and starch. That is what's recommended by the Equine Endocrinology Working Group. And some of that is because some of that extra carbohydrate and the WSC fraction may be available in the small intestine in certain situations. And so just as an extra safety measure, we want to consider that as well. So that's why we use those numbers. So hopefully that answered your question, Michelle. It may have created some new ones about what's as fed and dry matter. <laughs> yes. What is NF- and what is N- NFC? NFC, NFC that, that was going to be Cassie's uh, question to answer. Yeah, we'll let Cassie take that one. NFC, so that is the non-fiber carbohydrates. Uh, it's a little different from NSC. It's calculated slightly differently. So it's basically 100 minus your protein, NDF, your neutral detergent fiber. Fat, which in this case, the way we have it is a, a crude fat, ether extract is another name for it, and your ash content or your inorganic material, as opposed to the NSC being WSC plus starch. So NFC will include WSC and starch plus some of the other non-fiber components. So it's going to, if it's going to make the number be a little higher then, I'm guessing your NFC value will be higher. So you might, if you were looking at that one, you might discredit some hay for your insulin dysregulated horse that would actually be okay because the NSC might be low enough and safe enough, even though the NFC is higher. So that's, you know, it's, it's worth people understanding that, and it obviously F and S sound similar. So I think people, they hear this NFC, NSC, and they think it's the same thing and it's not. So it's important to kind of understand which one we're really talking about when we're talking about these horses. And I do think it's worth touching on the dry matter as fed thing. Because as fed, as the name suggests, is as you feed it, right? So as fed is as it comes out of the bale, if we're talking hay and you hand it to your horse, that is the as fed version of that hay. That's what you're really putting in front of your horse. Now, ruminant nutritionists really love dry matter for a number of reasons we won't get into. When I was in grad school, like it was all about dry matter and doing everything on a dry matter basis. Equine nutritionists don't work on a dry matter basis as much of the time. We're most concerned about what am I just putting in front of my horse and what is my horse eating? But the dry, just so people understand what dry matter is, Cassie, right? You evaporate the water out of the sample, right? Correct. Before you do all the analyses. And so it's the sample with no water. Correct. So the way that I like to teach people here, I have new technicians coming in the lab and I, I say that dry matter is the easiest and the most difficult concept to understand about forage analysis. What I like to think of is that you have a pie chart, okay? And you have, you know, different slices representing different components. So your protein, your fiber, the non-structural carbohydrates, fat and ash are really the big groups that you have. And then there's moisture. So when we're talking about as fed, moisture is a slice of that pie. When you talk about dry matter, we take that slice out and only look at the all of the other components besides moisture. So on a percentage basis, what you'll see is on the dry matter, your numbers will be higher than on the as-fed side because you've taken that moisture slice out of your pie and now everything else has to fill in to fill in the rest of that pie chart. So you'll increase, you'll see that your protein, your fibers, your fat, your starch will be higher on a dry matter basis as opposed to as-fed. Yeah, because the moisture can vary quite a lot between hays and between forage samples. It allows you to compare things apples to apples as opposed to apples to oranges as well. So that's why nutritionists kind of like it. But as an owner, you don't have to worry about it so much. And especially when you're looking at pasture. Right. You kind of forget how much moisture is in a pasture sample a lot until you, t- <laughs> until you test it. And you go, oh, wow, that's 80% water that I'm feeding. And I know some people that really blows their minds. Also treats, if you're doing carrots, just how much moisture is actually in a carrot is very surprising. Very surprising mm-hmm. to a lot of horse owners that we've gotten carrots before. We can test them. Send them on in. We'll test them. <laughs> oh my gosh. <laughs> so... We've been talking about the metabolic horses specifically because that is such a big driver in this. And I think for the horse owners, if we haven't said it yet, I want to make sure that people understand that the concern here is really laminitis. It's it's weight management and helping to prevent laminitis because these horses are so susceptible. Laminitis is a foot disease that can lead to founder, rotation of the coffin bone within the foot, very painful and often with a sad ending if it's not managed well or prevented. So 
just wanted to let everyone know in case we hadn't clearly said that that's why we are concerned about that. We are towards the end of our time together, but I have a little surprise game for the two that we're going to play to wrap this up for the horse owners. Uh oh. <laughs> and we're, before we're gonna, we play that though, Michelle, before we play that, I have one question for Kathy. But okay. Last comment. Uh-oh. What is the weirdest thing you've ever been sent to analyze? I mean, you've been there 13 years. I mean, anything oh, really bizarre? Well, I should preface it by saying we also do testing for zoos and aquariums. Uh, uh, our Aquarius services. We also do pet food testing and pet treat testing. So during the pandemic, people were at home. They had time on their hands. Oh gosh. And they said, you know what? I'm going to start making pet treats. And we actually provide an analysis package that will help fulfill the requirements for the guarantee tag. You know, tag you see on the bottom for big bags of feet and on the back of your horse treats and whatnot. I mean, there were a lot of pumpkin dog treats, on the zoo side, someone sent in an entire banana tree. Not it was about five feet tall. What? And they sent in an entire banana tree. How did you did, did you grind the whole thing? What did you know? We contacted them to see what parts of that tree the, the animal that the animal eats. <laughs> we it wasn't eating the entire trunk. Um, we were wow. testing for carnivores as well. Mm. So your alligators and lions, tigers, and bears, oh my, they all need to eat as well. So we have had some pretty bizarre stuff come in. The one thing we were not able to analyze was a horseshoe crab because we were unable to grind it down. It was too hard. Wow. That'd be the most unusual thing, but we didn't analyze it. But I think that banana tree probably... Probably takes the cake in terms of <laughs> the huge package came in. I'm, and it's I'm like, who's the, it, it's who's an the entire yes tree. person who had to deliver that tree? <laughs> <laughs> I, that I, think delivery, I don't know. I think our delivery people have given up on asking any questions <laughs> about what they see when walking through the doors here. Wow. All right, Michelle, what okay. game? Yeah, the game is that uh, Michelle has too many horses. So I am going to give some information about each one of my three horses that I own and the one that I take care of for my trainer that's boarded at my place. And I want to know from you what you would be looking for briefly on the analysis report. What would be the most important thing for that horse and helping figure out their diet? And this probably falls in Claire's wheelhouse as a nutritionist <laughs> and but we'll see if if Cassie has any thoughts as well. She's okay. she's on the data analysis, but she does have a background in metabolic syndrome and horses. So all right. My seat suddenly got very hot. Oh no. Are you ready? Are you ready? All right. Uh, okay. Here we go. Okay. So I have the coming three year old warm blood near 17 hands. <laughs> she came from a situation where she was very underweight. She's at a regular weight now but she'll be preparing in the next year to go into training and trying to keep weight on her. She doesn't, she's fussy about eating. Claire, what on that hay analysis is most important for her? Mm. I would be, obviously she's young and growing still. And so she needs to be able to actually, you want her to get the nutrition out of the hay, right? That that hay is offering. So I would be looking for a hay that is going to be pretty digestible. So again, I'm going to be looking at that ADF and probably something below about 30, you know, somewhere between 30 and 35% ADF would probably be nice, nice and digestible. Obviously, I mean, with all horses, calcium phosphorus ratio is important, but especially in young growing horses. So I'm going to want to make sure that my calcium value is definitely higher than my phosphorus, right? And um, so I'm going to be looking at that. And again, growing the protein, right? So looking to make sure that our crude protein doesn't need to be super duper high. She's three. She's not yearling anymore. But, you know, somewhere in that around about 12, you know, will be kind of nice 12% protein somewhere around there. And it's not to say I wouldn't feed her something that didn't meet all those criteria. But for example, like if it came back with like an 8% protein, then I'd know, which I'm imagining a grass hay here, right? I'm thinking a grass hay. I might want to think, hmm, not very good protein in this hay. Might want to add a little bit of alfalfa to get that protein up a little higher, right? So it just gives me that knowledge that I can make informed decisions. Do you have anything to add, Cassie? I think think Claire covered it pretty well. The the first thing that popped into my mind was the calcium phosphorus ratio. Mm -hmm. Yeah, like you said, for the growing horse. And, you know, 17 hands, it's 
She's, that's pretty yeah, good size. She's, so she's yeah, and that's and that's yeah. not me. That's not an exaggeration. That's I'm real about horse heights. You know, everyone thinks their horse is 16 hands, and that's not usually the case when you actually measure them. But this one, she she is gonna top out over 17 for sure. Okay, uh, second one: trail mare, mare half Arab, half warm blood, very active summer riding, but over this winter she has put on a little extra weight. She gets a much smaller portion, a ration than everyone else, which is very upsetting to her. Um, (laughs) And I have not had her, she's 12 years old. I've not had a senior panel done on her yet, but it's probably in her near future. Hmm. So she's one that I might feed something that was a little stemmier and a little less digestible so that you could feed more of it. So again, I'm going to be looking at maybe the ADF value, looking for something that's a little higher than the last horse. I'm probably going to also look at the calorie content, right? And let's just see. And again, Cassie looks at thousands of analyses, but in my mind, sort of a grass hay typically runs from about like 0.8 0.8 megacalories per pound, maybe up to if it's really good. Sometimes I see like 0.78, sometimes the high 0.7s up to like 0.9, maybe, maybe a little higher if it's really sort of digestible. I don't know, but you know, something with a, on the lower end of that is from a calories perspective. So that I can feed more pounds of it so she's less grumpy with you. Mm, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, something that encourages chewing or else she'll find something else to chew on, right? Yeah. yeah. That'll be the next thing. <laughs> Which is her pa- her uh, her pasture mate. <laughs> yes, I was going to be saying, you'll be sending Cassie a fence rail to Adeline. Right? <laughs> I know. We need, I know. We could have talked about donkeys, and uh, I, but <laughs> yeah, <laughs> they're even harder to feed because they're so hungry, but they need so little. So pasture mate is a gelding, not insulin dysregulated, but does have PPID, Mm -hmm. harder keeper, but still gets some adiposity over parts of his body. By adiposity, I mean fat pockets. Mm -hmm. So, so far, I need three different kinds of hay, don't I, Cassie? (laughs) (laughs) I don't know. I mean, I think you could probably actually, actually, you know what, if you had those two hays we've just mentioned, you could probably feed a combination of both of them to your third horse. Right, because he actually does need to get. He needs, he needs that middle ground a little bit, right? He needs that slightly higher protein value because we know our PPID horses don't. You know, their ability to maintain lean muscle mass is not so great. You need it to be a little more digestible if he can be a little hard keeper, but not super tons of calories if he gets his fat pocket. So that kind of combination of the best. You kind of need the best of both worlds. So if you had both in your barn, you could feed him a little bit of both. Yeah. Yeah. And Cassie, from your time studying PPID horses, was that because everyone thinks of the PPID horses, the easily overweight horse? Did you see the thin ones also? Yes, a lot of them. I appreciated the work I did during my graduate research, but boy, that, yeah, that was pretty tough. These people that were in the situation like you were, they said, well, I can't put weight on him, but then he has these fat deposits on his body. What do I do? What do I do? And it was a little bit of like with your mare being, you know, on the easy keeper side as well, where you want to keep them chewing on something. You want to give them some quality calories, but at the same time, not have it be too good and trying to find that balance. I think a lot of it, you know, comes down to management as well. You you want to test your hay, and even if it's not the ideal hay, you still have some management tricks in there that you can use to navigate around that. But I did see quite a few that were very poor top line, very shaggy, very ribby, but then with the fat deposits as well. Yeah. Yeah, mm-hmm. okay. yeah and I just have to do my plug, Michelle, because you know yes. me. Yes. You can fix a lot of the things that are not in your hay and not right with your hay with a ration balance. Ration balancer. <laughs> <laughs> yes. You know how much I love ration balancers. Yes. I had to. I couldn't resist. <laughs> yes. So, okay. Last horse before we wrap. That's the performance mare coming eight years old in heavy work five days a week working towards being an FEI horse. Easy keeper despite the workload but also hungry as well, <laughs> as well and needing a lot of energy for the kind of work that is expected of her. She's having to do a lot of collection and, and yeah. uh, pretty intense work. So she would definitely be in the category of your young mare, young horse, right? With the grass hay anyway, I'd probably have a better quality grass hay that she's going to be able to 
digest easily with a good amount of protein. She might be of the three, a candidate for a little bit of alfalfa as well. Just, you know, again, for that better amino acid profile, a few more calories per pound. They tend to run a little higher in calories per pound. I personally don't feed more than about 25-30% of the total forage intake as alfalfa. Otherwise, I feel like you kind of, you get too much protein and too much calcium and then they've urinated out and then they're stall smell of ammonia and onwards and onwards. So just that sort of sweet spot to me is about 25-30% of their forage intake as alfalfa if you, if you feel you need that. And then that way, I mean, you mentioned she's an easy keeper, but, you know, she needs the energy. I, you know, I'd rather, if I can, get there with energy from forage than being tempted to go down the higher calorie performance grain route, unless you really need to. Those have their place. But like we've mentioned before, keeping horses chewing, keeping them eating, kind of honoring how they're designed to be fed, I think is really important. So for her, the, you know, the better quality grass, hey, if that made her a little too heavy, then I might go with actually the less digestible grass, hey, and improve it with a little bit of alfalfa. You'd have to play around with that to kind of find out where she, you know, where she falls exactly. So, and Cassie, is it horse owners like me who keep analytical in business? <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> if by people like you, you mean people that care about their horses? <laughs> yes. With lots of needs. Those are with their own individual needs. We appreciate that at Equa Analytical and me especially, like I said, for my graduate research from all of the horse experience that I have, I have an appreciation for people that come to us, uh, especially when they're in a really stressful situation or they're trying to buy hay, being able to deliver services to those people. I know the situation. I know how difficult it can really be. So when someone calls and we're able to fulfill some of their needs, hopefully all of them, but at least some of their needs to help them with managing their horse's health. That is very rewarding for not just me, but everyone here on the Equi-Analytical team. It's very important to us. And we're very happy to be those horse people here in the dairy world. <laughs> <laughs> well, we are happy that you were able to join us. Uh, super fun conversation. Lots of deep science there. Hopefully some also simple things that people can take home to test their hay, buy their hay, and feed their horses a little bit better. So Cassie, thanks for joining us. Oh, thank you so much for having me. Yeah, and I just want to say that if anybody's listening and they want to test their hay and they're all motivated, all the information on like how to take a sample, how to submit a sample, the actual form you have to fill in and send with the sample is on the Equialytical website. And it's very easy to navigate. It's all right there. So if you get when you get out there, you're like, oh, I don't know where to stick the probe in the bale. Like they have a diagram that shows you how to do it. It's all there. So the website, go go visit their website and familiarize yourself with that and you'll figure out what you have to do. If you've been listening and you have any questions about your hay analysis or feeding your horses or any other equine nutrition questions, you can send them to info at scoopandscale.com and is spelled out. That's info at scoopandscale.com. You can find us on Facebook, and Instagram and LinkedIn for our socials. Uh, we're on all of the podcast platforms. If you look for us on, on Apple or Amazon or Spotify, we're there. Um, please like, listen, share. We appreciate that. You can also find Claire at clarityequine.com. For the Scoop and Scale podcast, I'm Michelle Anderson. And I'm Dr. Claire Tunis. Thanks for riding along with us. 